All right, perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are really excited for this afternoon's um, webinar. We are going to discuss um, developing plans to mentor alternate certification candidates. Um, we do have a number of panelists, um, a number of school leaders, school system leaders who actually piloted approaches to mentoring alternate certification candidates in 2018-19. So they're going to share with you how they um, made their plans and the impact that they saw in their own systems when they implemented mentoring. Before we get started, I also want to take an opportunity um, to introduce you to David Rose Rosenberg. David Rosenberg is a partner at ERS and worked with a number of school systems who piloted this in the 1819 school year. Um, David, can you say a quick hello to everyone? Hi, I'm uh, so grateful to be here uh, with you and appreciate that you're all able to spend the time uh, with us, with everything else that is happening uh, in the world. Your dedication is super inspiring. Thank you so much, David. All right, so um, we have three objectives for um, the next hour. So the first thing is we do want to take a few minutes just to talk about the importance of mentoring. You know, as David mentioned, there's so much going on in our world right now. And we think it's important just to take a pause and talk about, you know, in this moment, why is the mentoring for our new teachers even more important than ever? We're then going to take a few minutes just to talk about the mentoring requirements for alternate certification candidates. So there is a new policy requirement that's going into effect this fall. Um, and then really the bulk of our session is going to be hearing from school system leaders, from mentor teachers, um, from the candidates who are being mentored about um, what it was like for them when they piloted this and then how you can take steps to um, develop a plan for mentoring alternate certification candidates in the upcoming school year. Um, I would ask, so you all are going to be on mute throughout the presentation. I would ask if you have specific questions, please put them in the chat box. We are going to pause throughout the presentation and take questions. Um, okay, so this is just a little slide about ERS. And we're gonna go ahead and dive in. So um, the mentoring work, um, as, you, as you may know, kind of falls within, in terms of our state's priorities, this work around teacher and leader preparation. So this is first and foremost about ensuring that all teacher candidates, including those prepared in our alternate certification routes, um, have strong preparation and strong mentoring. Um, and so when we think about this, what I would like to do is first provide a little bit of background information um, about the policy shifts. As some of you may know, um, it's actually about half of new teachers who are trained every year in our state who are trained through alternate certification routes. So every year we have about 2,200 new teachers who are trained and a little over a thousand of them are prepared through this alternate certification route. Um, as some of you may also know, in our state, um, we are one of only two states in the entire U.S. that now requires a year-long residency for our undergraduate candidates. When the board passed the uh, policy back in 2016 saying um, that undergraduate candidates need to have this full year of mentorship before they receive their level one, the board also asked us to think about how could we strengthen the mentorship for all our alternate certification candidates. And so the pilots that we are going to talk about and then the policy shift were based directly upon this feedback from the board and from school system leaders that, you know, it is really wonderful that in our state, there's a full year of mentorship for undergraduate candidates. And it's so important that alternate certification candidates also receive mentorship. One of the reasons that we know that this is so important is because when we look at the data, we see that our alternate certification candidates have lower retention than teachers prepared through our undergraduate routes. And research also tells us that structured support from a strong mentor teacher actually erases 
or reduces most of this first year teacher effect. And so in 2018-19, um, we worked with ERS and a number of school systems to pilot um, innovative and cost neutral approaches to supporting alternate certification candidates. Based upon those pilots, based upon the research, um, Bessie approved regulatory updates last year um, to strengthen mentoring for alternate certification candidates. And so the two policy shifts that the board approved is first um, to remove um, an 80 hour pre residency practice requirement um, for alternate certification candidates and then to replace that um, with an assurance from each school system that for all alternate certification candidates in that first year when they're on a practitioner license um, that those candidates are mentored for five hours a week. Um, that this mentorship includes opportunities to co-teach observation and feedback sessions and also collaborative planning sessions. One thing that's important to note with this policy requirement is that um, the mentor teacher who is working with the alternate certification candidates does need to have um, the mentor certificate um, a second thing that's very important to note is that that mentor teacher can also collaborate with others in the school system to provide that mentoring and that support. Um, so what we have here are actually a few quotes um, from some of the mentors and some of the candidates who went through um, the pilots. Um, Overwhelmingly, the feedback from um, the pilots that happened in 1819 were very, very positive. And so I do want to go ahead right now um, and actually start with our panel discussion. So as I mentioned at the beginning, we invited some of the school systems who piloted um, this new approach to mentoring in 1819 to share their experiences with you. And so um, we have folks from the city of Bogalusa and also from West Carroll Parish. What we're going to do now is I have a few initial questions that I'm going to um, ask of our panelists. And then after that, um, we'll open it up to see if you all have a few questions before then turning it over to the part of our presentation where we're really digging into how to develop a strong plan for your candidates for the upcoming year. So um, I'm going to start actually with a question for our school system leaders and our school leaders. Um, so this question is going to go to Ms. Boyt, Ms. Smith, and um, Ms. Reeves. So one of the things um, that we know is given our current circumstances, school systems have so very much to plan for. We are really in unprecedented circumstances. And I know for some, the idea of creating a plan to mentor alternate certification candidates might seem overwhelming. And so we would like to hear from you all, you know, what impact did you see in your own school system after implementing um, your plan for mentoring for alternate certification candidates? So this is Christy Boyd from West Carroll Parish, and we actually participated in the pilot because we were dealing with a revolving door of teachers. We had every year we would hire alt cert candidates. They would come in, do a year and maybe two years and then go out. And so we were trying to address the revolving door with the pilot. And just as we move forward, I mean, we don't know what we're looking at, but we think that the, the shelter and the support that we learned how to provide during that pilot year and that we implemented in this past year as well are essential for the success of the mentees who participated in the program. Thanks so much, Christy. And can you tell us, but before we turn it over to others on your team and then also Ms. Reeves, I know you said that retention was one of the key reasons you participated in the pilot. Can you let us know like what the initial results were after implementing the mentoring? 
In our first year, we had approximately 20 candidates. We, we were in, encouraged to focus on one school site. Because we had candidates across the district and in core areas of the curriculum, we talked with ERS and with the Department of Education, and we were able to focus in really on three sites. So we did that, and on those three sites, we had 17 candidates. And in the past, as I said, it was a revolving door, but I can say that most of those candidates are still with us. There were only probably two or three who left the system or left education completely. But sometimes that's necessary as well. That's not necessarily a bad thing because if someone is certified in another, or if they're qualified um, in another career field and they come to education thinking that it's gonna be like what they see on television or what they experienced as a student when they were a child. And it's not, it's not like that anymore. Um, sometimes if, if those expectations are not met, then they may wanna go back to what they were previously doing and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And, and so with the two or three that we lost, that was the situation. Um, so the first year we kept all but two or three and I can tell you that in our second year, we have essentially worked ourselves out of a job. At, at this point, we're in a hiring freeze. Um, that's, that's really something that as a result of this, you have so many more candidates who are staying. Um, how about for Bogalusa, um, Ms. Reeves, what's some of the impacts that you all saw um, for the city of Bogalusa? Um, hello, everyone. I'm happy to be with you today. Uh, um, I'm eager to learn more about how we can best support our new teachers. And during the time that we implemented the pilot in our schools, the new teachers and the mentors strengthened their collaborative practices. Um, they all gained experience in sharing knowledge and respecting the opinions and ideas of others, supported each other in completing tasks meeting deadlines and accessing resources. Um, based on the feedback that I received from the principals and the mentor, the mentor and pilot program had a positive influence on teacher performance. Um, the mentor and the new teachers also expressed an appreciation for, um, for the learning experience and the additional time to collaborate and co-teach with each other. Um, I think providing this extra support is one way to show the teachers that we care about the struggles they face um, as a new teacher and that we understand their needs. Wonderful, thanks so much for sharing. And so you all have talked about the initial impact um, that you saw that this had within your school systems. Um, let's think a little bit about, you know, given the uncertainty that we're all facing right now, what is your take on the new importance of this, given that uncertainty? Oh, and I don't know, Ms. Boyd or Ms. Reeves, if you're trying to speak. If so, we can't hear you. Okay, I'll speak. <laughs> Can you hear me? Um, I know that there's a lot of uncertain times coming and we don't know, you know, how the new school year will be. But regardless, I think that it's important every year and not just this year or, or not with just a program in place. I think it's important every single year for school systems to plan um, to support new teachers um, and retain teachers. And um, I've, I have observed so many new teachers struggle with teaching daily lessons and because they lack experience with classroom management and time management. And these teachers work so hard to learn the curriculum and prepare for the lesson, but they feel defeated when they're unable to deliver the instruction. Um, and that could be even more difficult in the um, upcoming year. I think it's, a, it's gonna be a learning experience for everyone. And um, 
even some of our more experienced teachers. But the collaboration between the new teacher and the mentor can provide the support needed for the new teacher to grow through a, um, supportive practice and collaborative planning and getting that daily feedback. And this situation moves support from just telling the teachers, you know, what they need to do to actually doing it with them. And I think that's important to plan for the new year. How are you gonna actually do it with the new teachers? And they're not required to learn the hard way and they don't have to fall down, fall down 20 times just to get it right. Um, because that method of learning to teach was gonna have a negative impact on our school system um, regardless of what comes you know, in the future. Um, the teachers are gonna grow at a slower pace um, are they going to leave for a more supportive environment or seek another profession? And the school system's going to experience an increase in teacher turnover, which our school system has for many, many years. And most of all, our students are going to suffer if we don't plan and make really good plans to support our new teachers um, because we can't wait for them to just get it right. Um, the students will struggle for the upcoming years, and I think they deserve an equal opportunity to succeed. And so it's extremely important that we do a lot of planning to support our new teachers. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. I think it would be helpful. So we actually have two of the new teachers um, who were mentored in 1819. We have Mr. Tujo and also Mr. Rios, and we would love to hear from both of you. Uh, what what was your experience like being mentored in the eighteen nineteen school year? Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start first. This is Mr. Tujo um, with Bogalusa City Schools. It was it was a it was a wonderful experience. I will say uh, it was my second year teaching, and you know it can be very overwhelming not just the material, having to learn that and having to figure out the best way to teach it to the students. But like, you know, you said earlier, the classroom management part of it, um, how to use your time wisely, how to intervene and use interventions when necessary. And it just gives you a good backup plan. You know, when you have somebody there, it's, it's almost like, you know, my, my confidence was high because I knew I had somebody there to, to lean on in case I got stuck and, and didn't know what to do. Um, uh, that was my second year teaching that I had my, my mentor and she was wonderful. And it was like the greatest thing ever. I gotta say, if it's not done regularly for new teachers everywhere, I, I'd say I'd, I'd recommend that it needs to be done whether or not the new teachers wanna do it or not, because it's, it's just, valuable lessons learned from someone who's been there from a veteran who you know can say well you did a good job on this but let me show you what 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 you could have done differently to make this situation a little bit better you know it was just it's kind of hard to explain but just being there and having someone with you and growing with them you know i learned from from my mentor and and she learned from me so it was like we both you know we both just I don't want to say like we had a ball, but we did. We had a great time when we did it together, you know, and it was it was valuable, valuable lessons learned from her that you really can't get from a college course or, you know, any kind of certification classes, things like that. This is just like, you know, how you say on the front lines with your your fellow, your backup plan right with you. And, and let me tell you, it was just it was it was good for me. It was easy for me because we got along well and we fed off of one another. And I'll let, go ahead and let Mr. Rios uh, tell his story now. I feel like I've taken a lot of time. <laughs> I will if I can figure out how to unmute that, sorry. Uh, my mentor year was my first year teaching and that worked out really, really good for me. Uh, I, I actually had two mentors. Christy Harrington was one of mine. Uh, she was like my official on the books mentor and she would help me when she could. We kind of had conflicting schedules. And then I have another teacher that teaches two doors down for me. She's been teaching for 30 plus years and uh, she kind of took me under her wing. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of set times where we met. If I had a problem, I could go to either Christy or Miss Bell anytime I needed. 
I ate lunch with Miss Bell every day last year just to ask her questions. You know, this happened to me in class today or how, you know, this is how I handled it. What should I have done? Does that sound good? Uh, I, every school should do a mentor program. I don't care if it's through the Louisiana Department of Education, just something they throw together. Just find somebody that can help you that you can talk to. Uh, if you're a high school teacher, find a high school teacher, a positive person. Just especially first year people, you need to be around positivity. Uh, we've all got those people at our schools that aren't quite as positive as, as we need to be, but you know, you've got to find somebody positive with your similar thinking, similar, similar classes uh, that can lead you in the right way. You know, it's, there's a lot of stress the first year, you know, I mean, heck, this was my second year. There's a lot of stress this year with this whole COVID stuff going on. It's, it's stressful and, and you need people to bounce ideas off of reassurance. That's something that you really, really need as a first year teacher is a lot of reassurance. You know, every day is not going to be sun, sunshine and roses, but it's worth it for the kids. And it, it helps when you've got somebody there that's got your back. So thanks. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and actually, the next question is for we also have a mentor teacher. Um, from, from West Carroll Parish with us. And so we would love to hear a little bit from you, Ms. Harrington. What was your experience like um, as a mentor teacher? And then why do you think that this mentorship um, is so important given um, what we're facing the, during the upcoming school year? Hey, uh, my time as a mentor, I enjoyed it. Our school is a really small school, so we had to be creative, like Mr. Rio said. It was more of a tag team effort between me and Ms. Bell helping him. So you just have to get creative in the smaller schools. And I think that that's okay. I don't think there's any one set way that we should do it. I enjoy doing it, but it's all about relationships. That's the most important thing being a mentor teacher. You have to be able to teach these younger teachers or new teachers, not necessarily younger, but the new teachers how to do things the correct way. In, my way might not be the right way, but together we figure it out. And I think that it's a great program. I agree with Kent when he said that every school needs to do it. The new teachers, they need the support. When I came in as an alternate certification candidate 15 years ago, I didn't have any help. I had zero support. I just kind of figured it out as I went. And that's just not the way to do it. So I think that what we have in place is um, a great plan. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I think what I would like to do now is, um, so you all have created your plans for mentoring alternate certification candidates already. So you know a little bit about, um, you know, what it was like to create the plans. For so many of our school systems, the idea of having a plan in place so that every alternate certification candidate on their first year in a PL is mentored for five hours a week, it's a lot to think about. And there are a number of steps that school systems will need to take to get this plan together. And so what we would like to do now is go ahead and start walking through the steps um, to create plans for the upcoming year. And then as we are doing this, I'm going to ask you all, um, so Ms. Foyt, um, uh, Ms. Reeves, who have already done this, to, just to share a bit of advice for our school systems um, regarding um, how they can get a strong plan together. So um, before I get into the four steps in creating a plan, I do want to say a, a quick note about the number of alternate certification candidates we expect will need to be mentored in the upcoming year. So when we look at our data, what we see um, is that um, and, and what you're looking at on this slide is um, the, for all of our public schools in Louisiana over the last three years, how many alternate certification candidates did each school hire that was on their first year on a PL? Because those are the candidates who will need to be mentored beginning this fall. So you can see that there were actually 768 schools that hired zero on average um, alternate certification candidates. Um, we had about 460 schools who hired one alternate certification candidates. 
on their first year, 134, that higher two. And then what we see is that we do have some schools who on average are hiring three, four, or five alternate certification candidates in a year. So we know that in terms of the lift of creating a plan, it is going to look different in each school. And I think Ms. Harrington, your point is very well taken about that this there needs to be a customized plan for each school given the variance that we're seeing. So when you think about how am I going to create this plan um, to mentor alternate certification candidates, uh, there are four key steps um, that we think are important to keep in mind. So number one, make sure you have a clear sense of how many alternate certification candidates will need support. Then think about who in your system um, can support them. So think about who's the certified mentor, who they'll be paired with. Um, and then are there others in your system um, who can support in offering that five hours a week? Step three is then to create the protected time for the mentors and the candidates to work together. And then step four um, is, is again, just thinking about getting your plan together for the others who are going to collaborate. We do have a number of resources available to you um, as you're developing this plan. Um, we, do, we did generate what we're calling an alternate certification data package. Um, so if you would like to know for each school in your system, on average, how many alternate certification candidates did they hire over the last three years, you can email my colleague Eric or email me. I'll get that information to you right away. We also have a mentor certification data package. Um, this provides you with information about which teachers in your school and school system are eligible for the mentor teacher certification. We have a list of institutions who are approved to um, offer the training. And then we also have a toolkit. So I wanted to make sure you know that. Okay, so here we are. I'm going to go through the first two steps a little bit um, more quickly because um, these I think are a bit more straightforward. We were hoping actually to have a quick poll for some of these questions. I think that we've determined um, that the poll is not going to be possible given that we're live streaming. Is that right? Oh, we have it up. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so what we would like to ask you to do for this first poll is um, it would be helpful for us just to get an understanding. Um, so for your own school, um, anybody who's on for your own school, about how many alternate certification candidates do you believe will need to be mentored during the upcoming year? I'm going to give you all just another minute. We'll give you 30 more seconds. It looks like we have 38 of our 84 participants who have completed the poll, just another 30 seconds. So we'll go ahead and end the poll. So as you can see here, for, um, for the folks on the line, um, it looks like we have, can you all see the results? 
Yep. Okay, great. Um, so we have some, so we had a, about 45 people um, who participated in the poll and you can see that um, for the people on the line, you believe that it's probably about one to two people um, who will need this mentoring for the upcoming year. Um, okay, so this is kind of the first step is thinking about how many candidates will need to be mentored. Um, you know, we can provide the data package if that's helpful. Um, also, of course, you'll need to speak to each school leader to determine how many first year candidates they're planning to mentor. Then once you've done that, this is the next step where you're thinking about, okay, now that I know um, the number of candidates, then how am I going to pair the candidates with each of the mentors? So you can definitely look at the data package that we have put together um, and then also think about, you know, if that mentor needs to be certified, how will you get a plan together for certifying them? Um, one quick question for our school system leaders who, um, who piloted this. Do you have any advice for other school system leaders in terms of this pairing process? So when you went through this, what would you say are some of the most important aspects to keep in mind? So this is Christy from West Carroll and we let our principals make those pairing decisions because they know their people um, better than better than district personnel do and because they have held the interviews with the people that, that they were considering hiring for the position so we just we left our principals um, with the responsibility of assigning unless they wanted assistance with that task and there were just several benefits to that because as um, the the group from forest high school was sharing the first year they had six mentees and three mentors. So we made sure that we chose people who were um, qualified to serve as mentors. And that year we didn't, we had people in training, but they weren't already certified. Um, but really it was up to the principal to work with the mentors to determine the schedules that they would need and, and to, um, ensure that they would be able to meet the needs of the mentees. Got it, thanks so much for sharing. Um, Ms. Reeves, did you have anything else or that you'd like to yes. add? Um, I think in my opinion, when it comes to pairing um, a mentor and these new teachers that a lot of thought needs to be put in the pairing of the mentors and the new teachers. The new teachers do not need additional stress of having a mentor that has an overbearing personality. Um, your mentor should, they should have qualities other than just teaching experience. They should have a positive personality um, because we don't want to grow negativity in our new teachers. Um, whenever they work with someone who's energetic and has a positive personality, um, it helps them with the stress that they face every single day. Um, they look forward to seeing that teacher whenever they're having a bad day and that mentor comes in, you know, comes in um, to support them. So I think that, that for the program to be successful and to really help and grow these teachers, it's important that you think about the personalities of the two people that you're putting together. Or it's, to me, it's just a waste of time if, um, if they struggle with accepting each other's opinions and views and supporting each other and it, and it leaves them with um, a bad feeling every day, um, it's not gonna lead the school in the direction that you want it to go. Thank you so much for sharing that. So um, as Ms. Reeves and Ms. Boyd are saying, this idea of pairing candidates with mentor teachers is so, so important and really thinking about um, ensuring that it's a good match in terms of relationships, also in terms of skill sets. And I think it's helpful to hear, especially the approach that you took in West Carroll, um, Christy, which was around um, you know, believing that the school leader really has a good idea of that. So ensuring that they're in that position where they can kind of make that match. Okay, so 
Um, the next step here, and this is the one that, that really gets into the heart of it, right? Once you've paired them, how is it um, that you can create protected time for the mentors and the candidates to work together? Now, what we have outlined here are just a few strategies that the school systems who piloted this took in order to create that structured time. One thing that I do want to stress is that as you are thinking about your plan for the upcoming year, we know that the alternate certification candidate needs to be mentored for five hours per week. Um, their mentor teacher does need to have the mentor certification and if you are in a position where maybe the mentor teacher could work with them for two or three hours a week and you need somebody else in your school system to also support the alternate certification candidate, they can do that. So another important thing that we'll talk through is how do you determine who else in your system might support them. So when we think about how to create protected time, we just have three ideas. Um, from our piloting school systems about how they created time for mentors to support candidates. Um, so in some of their school systems, their teachers had non-instructional duties. So maybe they had bus duty, lunch duty. And so they released the candidates and mentors from those non-instructional duties to create that time. Some of them scheduled the planning periods for the mentor teacher and candidate at the same time. So this way um, they can actually co-plan together and have that collaborative um, planning time. And then the other thing that some school systems did is um, that if you have somebody else um, who's qualified that they could actually cover some of the classes for the mentor um, so that it would give the mentor um, more time to work with that candidate. Um, we know that given the uncertainty for the upcoming year, it's also important to create a contingency plan. Um, I'm actually going to ask um, David to share a few thoughts on contingency planning um, for the upcoming year. Before I turn it over to him, um, I did just want to pull out a quick example from our toolkit about how it is that you could think about creating a schedule um, for your alternate certification candidates to work with your mentors. So I'm gonna voice over this quickly. And then David, if you have any initial thoughts on, or any additional thoughts, I would appreciate it if you could share them. Um, so this is one of the case studies that we have in the alternate certification toolkit. And what you can see with this one, so we have one mentor teacher who's working with two candidates and the way the school system accomplished this is they made sure um, that the mentor and both of the candidates had a common planning session together at the beginning of the day. And so then with that, they're getting that collaborative planning time. Um, so that's just a very quick example. And then David, can you talk any, anything else that you would add for this example? And then we would love to hear a few thoughts from you around contingency planning for the upcoming year. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanna name that this and so many other examples are in the toolkit that the department has released um, uh, that we were able to contribute to. And so you don't have to start from scratch in this. It's really uh, important for, for this type of work. Um, I would say the model that's that's shown here is one of the things that I think was really exciting in West Carroll and Bogalusa, other parishes were were the pilot is that times when a little goes away, right? And so we scare us all the time. You can do anything, but you can't do everything, right? You have to make trade-offs about how you use resources. So you will discipline about those. And so even the small act of having, you know, one co-teaching period out of the day, even the act of being we're going to put or your planning period to be together. And I saw 70% of you said you were planning to do that uh, in the poll. Like a couple of those moves together actually adds up to a pretty fundamentally different experience for the, for the, um, for the new teacher. So I think on this model, I'd say, look, the, the, those things matter and they, and they add up in terms of contingency planning. Um, I, I think what I would uh, uh, just state here is that like, 
we're in such a challenging time that figuring out and being clear on why it is we're working towards anything is so important. And the why of this work is not about, yes, there are requirements at the regulatory level. Yes, there are issues in terms of sort of things that are, uh, that are initiatives that have been launched. But ultimately this is about how do you create study in your schools and community in your schools and using the entrance of new teachers as part of that strategy. And I, I know there's so much that we have to do right now, but the idea of fostering greater stability and community are all in line with what I know we want for our kids and teachers and other educators coming back. And so, you know, we are working with districts all over the country and expect to be working with several in Louisiana about thinking about, hey, is it gonna be an in-person model, hybrid model or remote model? What are the scenarios gonna look like? And the variable we have in our reels have to build those. But when we keep in mind that there are certain um, attributes that we want to be true in any of those cases, because now more than ever, we do want uh, to, to build towards stability and community in our schools, which means not being radical amounts of turnover among the career teachers, then building this in as part of the sort of the core of anything we do, even if it's in a model that looks different than what we're used to, um, it becomes pretty important. And, and to be really clear about this, the, the, those core principles are about it uh, in the in the Twitter documents is this mix of sheltering the experience of the new teacher and developing the new teacher, right? So shelter is less responsibility, develop is more support. And it's the mix of those two things no matter what contingency you're planning for, that actually can create a really um, powerfully different experience and reduce the turnover that, um, that Christy was describing having seen before uh, going down this path. All right, thank you so much for sharing that, David. So what I would like to do now is, so we've talked at a high level about the first three steps. Um, and we know from the poll that for many of you that you actually believe that um, there are a few of the strategies that we have outlined here um, that would work in your school system. Um, so before we move on to this final step, I would like to just hear from some of our school systems from, you know, City of Bogalusa, from West Carroll, what advice do you have for other school systems about how to approach um, this um, problem of thinking about how do I create this protected time for mentors and candidates to work together? So what advice do you have for school systems as they're putting together this plan? I'll start. It's very difficult um, to develop a plan when a lot of your mentor teachers are in the classrooms. And so pulling them out of the classrooms makes it very difficult. So we have to think about um, which teachers that we have that are mentors that um, can move around and are not, in, you know, can maybe do something part of the day and then do something else the second half of the day. And we took, we had one of our teachers from high school teach uh, a block period at high school and then drive 10 minutes to come to our elementary school and spend the rest of the time with two teachers there. And so we had a very structured schedule where she, she was in their classroom every single day. She had time to co-plan with them. She had time to meet with them. It, it was a little difficult for her because she was moving about going to another school. Um, also took her away from her own school. Um, but at the time it was the only solution that we had and we needed to get more teachers trained. I think it's very important that that time that's uh, scheduled for the mentor is protected. And so with, if it's a little more structured 
And as we learn and, and we plan, it, it makes it easier to do that. Um, new teachers um, should meet with, you know, have time to meet with the district level um, to reflect and to plan on what's going on in these uh, new teachers' classrooms because the mentors need support too. Um, um, they sh we had our mentor maintain a daily log and, and, and reflect and keep, keep track of what kind of support she was giving to the teachers. Um, did they co-teach together? Did she observe the new teacher or the new teacher observe her? Did she provide feedback? What kind of issues? How can we help? Um, so I'm making a schedule to ensure that he or she is supporting the new teacher and the mentor's responsibilities are made clear to all the leadership teams and that the responsibilities are supported and monitored at the district level. I think it should, when you're planning, you should really think about not just throwing that mentor in there and saying, go help, go support, that it's something that um, a lot of people are involved in and a lot of people are supporting and monitoring and helping and, and giving resources. Um, so it worked for us. And so that's, that's the way that we're thinking for the upcoming year. Great, thanks so much for sharing. Um, how about from the West Carroll team? What advice do you have for school systems? So I picked up on um, several things that Charmaine said. We also had a collaboration. We had district collaborations once a month. Um, in the pilot year, we had on the first Wednesday of the month, all of the mentees came together, which that was our huge year. And we invited those, even those who were not involved in the pilot to come to collaborate with one another. Um, that did a few things. It helped to build relationships. It helped to let them know that they were not alone in the struggles that they were facing. It helped to create a safe space for them to voice their concerns, but also to have someone there with them to answer their concerns because we invited mentors to those meetings too. They, we didn't require them to attend, but we invited them and we had um, an overwhelming number of them who did come. And then the second Wednesday of every month, the mentors came together and they talked about what they were seeing in classrooms and they talked about the specific needs of mentees and they talked about scheduling issues and areas where they felt that they needed support. So at that point they had district support and also the support of, of one another as they were going through this process. So I think that it's really important for school systems to see this as a priority because if we don't get it right when the teachers are in their first year, it's very likely that we'll be doing it again the following year or within three years because that was uh, the average span of the teachers who were um, alt cert candidates who were coming into our district when we had the revolving door, one to three years. We kept them one to three years. Some of them we kept one semester. I'm just gonna be honest. Um, but it, it's, it's so very helpful because it is all about relationships. And the other thing that happened as kind of a byproduct of, of the mentoring plans and processes was that the whole attitude toward new teachers began to shift because the other thing was when someone would new would be hired, there wasn't like a, an overwhelming sense of, of welcome at the school. So um, they may not feel welcome. They may not feel supported. And it's not necessarily that they weren't welcome or supported. It's just that other teachers were very busy doing their own job and tending to their own students. So they may not have opened their door and said, hey, can, how can I help you? But when the, the need became visible and audible, like we talked about it and we um, began recruiting mentors and helping our seasoned teachers, especially those who are most effective, to realize that these needs are there, that you know these people who are coming in, they don't know, even the ones who are trained in an education program, they don't necessarily know what school looks like on a day-to-day -day basis in every school because the context of each school is different. So um, it's, it's just a really good plan. It's, it's a priority. And if it's not done and done well in the first year, it will be repeated. All right, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on planning. Um, and so um, 
I think that Ms. Boyd and Ms. Reeves shared important information about, you know, how to think about this holistically and also think about, um, you know, what's most important in terms of creating structured time. The last step that we have here that I just want to go through quickly before we open it up for questions is, you know, the way this is laid out, and I think you made this point, Ms. Reeves, as well, um, you know, given the context of each school, it might not be possible for one mentor teacher to have an hour every single day to work with the candidate. And so it's important to think about if you are in a situation where you have a mentor who can work with the candidate for a few hours a week, who are the other people in your school system who are well positioned to support that new teacher? And so you might think about if you have content leaders, if you have instructional coaches, if you have assistant principals, maybe these are all people who could also um, support your new teachers. Um, and I think another thing that you both raised is that it's so important um, for there to be this structured time and also important to think about if you have another person who is working with the mentor teacher, how are you going to make sure that they have structured time to meet together to talk about um, the areas of strength for the candidates and then also areas of growth. And so this is another important thing to keep in mind as those plans are being developed. Okay, so with that in mind, I do want us to save a few minutes um, just to hear um, from our participants. Would love to hear um, if you have any questions for the panelists or if you have any thoughts to share about um, the plans that you're creating in your own school systems. Um, I was on a call with one of our school systems last week um, and they were sharing a lot about the plans um, that they have. And so would love to hear either questions for the panelists or also if you have thoughts about your own plans you would like to share, let's open them up. And we have the chat box open so you can um, call out any questions. If you would like um, to share something and you would rather say it verbally, go ahead and just raise your hand and then we'll take you off from mute. All right, I am not seeing any questions at this point in time. Um, I do, okay, I saw just one thing come in. Um, there are a few of you who have been putting um, comments in that I've been sharing with everyone. So I have another one from Miss Cassie Carson just saying, um, how important the relationship is between the mentee and the mentor. Um, a note also um, from Ms. Harwell. Ms. Harwell, do you want to, sh to share a little bit about what you have here in terms of the planning? Let me see if I can take you off from mute. Give me just a half a second. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Good. Right when you asked to talk, I had a B-52 flying over my house, so that wouldn't have been good. Um, <laughs> um, we're in Caddo, and we have a very large district uh, with 60 schools, and probably at least half of them have at least one PL, if not also residents from some of the many local universities. Um, so finding the tracking system on top uh, to, to match people on top of making sure that they are trained or qualified because we're loving the three-year window, but um, also tracking the, the five hours of support and the variety of ways that that can be given 
is um, what is stretching our brains this summer. And um, so we have come up with some kind of documentation that they're going, the mentee and or mentor are going to submit once a week to help justify the attestation at the end of the year that we have to submit for their licensure. Um, we are also working with um, other programs in con that we're doing in conjunction with just overall teacher support to try to meld the two so that we can work smarter instead of harder on the support that we give all teachers. Because um, we know um, with the, the support we already have established, we're refining it and making it better to not only support our new teachers, but all of our teachers so that they um, can help grow our students. Awesome. Thanks so much for sharing, Cassie. That's really helpful to hear. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to do a quick check just to see if we have any other raised hands or questions coming through. All right, um, I'm not seeing any other questions. So before I um, close this out and move us on to next steps, I do wanna do a final call just for our panelists. Is there anything else that you all would, are dying to share before we close out for this afternoon? So anything else that you didn't have a chance to share um, that you would like to note before we end our time together? Sarah, I would just say that when we do our analysis and look across districts, the the you, the impact on retention is such a big piece of this work, as Ms. Boyd was describing. And so, I don't, in no way, do I want to short shift the improvements in culture, or the rapid improvement of teachers, or the, the opportunity for mentors to step into leadership roles. Those are all crucial, and they are contributors to what ultimately becomes getting at the core issue underneath it which is how do we ensure that we have more stability in our teacher force and get to the higher retention numbers that we need. And so ultimately that, that it takes a couple of years to start to see it as Ms. Boyd described, but when you see it, it makes a huge difference. Uh, even in a world where we think maybe, you know, more teachers might be sticking with their jobs in, in this uncertain time, it's still a huge contributor um, to school community and, and community stability. Um, and so that's, that's just ultimately that win is what sort of keeps our eye on, on, on the power of the work. All right, thank you so much, David. Um, okay, so we have just, this is actually perfect timing, two minutes left and I have two quick next steps. So one, as you are thinking about putting your plans together, if any school system um, would like support in terms of putting those plans together, please email me directly and we will support you in getting your plans together. If you need any of the data that we mentioned during this afternoon session, please email me as well and I will connect you with the right person to get the data. Um, and then finally, we are asking everybody to leave feedback for the sessions. And so we would really appreciate it if at some point in time, um, you could give us a little bit of feedback. Um, I have the information about how to do that there. And I think with that, I'm going to say a final thank you to our panelists. Thank you all so much for joining this afternoon and we'll close out. <laughs>